Okay, guys, so the last part of this lecture, um, we'll talk about an elephant in the room, right? So like this little cartoon here. Um, that elephant in the room is cardiac referral and participation, right? So something that we cannot uh, not discuss uh, when, we're, when we're talking about cardiac rehab, because it's a, it's a big problem and why the outcomes um, for a lot of these conditions could probably be better. So we look at the participation uh, so comparing, obviously, referred and versus non-referred, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a problem, right? You know, we look at a large number of patients, even those who are referred, um, these are looking at older adults, you know, showing a large number don't participate in really many, many sessions at all, like one to five, um, and it's, you know, only about 20%, right, per completing all of them. There's a study that looked, and the study looked at uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services data over three years, and they examined about 60,000 eligible patients um, ages 65 or older for cardiac rehab. Of those patients, about 36,000 were, 62%, were referred at the time of hospital discharge. Of those referred, about 33% attended at least one session. Um, of those initially referred, um, or those initially not referred, only 8% uh, of them attended at least one session. So it's a big problem, especially with older adults. And if we look at, there's even uh, differences amongst uh, demographics, right? So if we look at uh, men versus women, look at different um, uh, ethnic um, backgrounds that, you know, in terms of people who getting getting referred, typically higher completion rates in um, younger individuals um, and different referral patterns as well. Um, so again, this is just looking at Medicare beneficiaries by uh, men uh, or gender, by ethnicity and by age breakdown. And obviously we see some disparities in participation um, between uh, you know, uh, looking at white versus black, uh, Hispanic and Asian and the higher uh, numbers of individuals who initiate and complete uh, being in white men. And that, that's a bit of a problem, right? Because it's not a disease that only affects white men. It affects women, men and women of every different ethnicity, right? And especially if you look at certain demographics, looking at, you know, uh, Black and African Americans, especially in, in Hispanic or uh, Latinx, um, you know, higher prevalence is cardiometabolic disease in these populations. So we, we definitely have some room uh, to work here. And again, if we look at, in terms of referral, uh, participation rights, it's really stayed pretty abysmal for, you know, mo for, for quite a long time. This is data looking back at uh, 2015. It's, it's hovered around participation right around 35% with some slight upticks here, but it's hovered around that, you know, it hasn't changed much. And we find that referral rates, um, you know, or, uh, between 2000 and 2007 or about 60% after um, a revascularization. So like, you know, and we're finding that these referral rates have actually increased. Um, if we look at, you know, post MI from uh, 20, 2007 to 2012, it went up to 72, from 72% to 80%. So we started at 56 72, and now we're at 80%. So a lot of people are getting referred, right? But we haven't seen wholesale changes in participation, right? So referral matters, like it does matter. And like there are still significant amounts of people who don't even ever get referred. But we gotta start looking at like, what's what's the, what's the fact, what, what other factors are at play here? Because we've improved referral rates but some patients aren't getting, aren't participating. We look at barriers, it's the same exact barriers to exercise. People have limited financial resources. There's often a copay, transportation difficulties. Um, you know, prior to our facility opening here in Chicago, we, there was not a cardiac rehab facility. Um, in the west side of Chicago, they really sort of the soft side of Chicago. People had to go outside of the city, go to the suburbs, or come to, you know, like, um, private pay hospital like Northwestern um, or other institutions for cardiac rehab. There really weren't facilities in the entire Illinois Medical District where we're located. There's four massive hospital systems. 
um, really was not a formal program until we started one. And that, that's a bit of a problem because certain pot patients like could not get out to those facilities. Um, you know, we're finding as well if people, uh, if, if, if there isn't physician support for those programs, that, that does matter. And then it's, it's a big problem in general for, for rehabilitation irrespective of condition. There's often a lack of coordination between what happens at the inpatient side and the outpatient clinic. And there's a lack of communication. So, um, you know, there, you know, I fortunately was in a facility and I've always been working in a facility that, you know, our, we get a lot of referrals from our hospitals are all in the same system, but that, that's not the case for everybody that there may be, you know, we're seen at one hospital system and trying to do the rehab at another facility. So these are all things that could be barriers. And, and all these are also opportunities to, to address, to improve referral and participation rates, most notably. So um, again, if we look at uh, other barriers, right? So we see higher rates of participation for cabbage than acute MI, than just pure medical management. And we think there may be a geographical influence. So patients in the Southeast and West regions are less likely to participate than those in the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, so there may be different variants in terms of cultural beliefs towards rehab or access. Um, and we're finding again, you know, there's maybe some ethnic um, influences too, in terms of like who people's perception of who gets heart disease, right? We looked at outcomes for acute MI and, you know, the disparity between men and women in terms of who gets stented, who gets CPR. The same sort of things happen as well. Like we, you know, um, older male, white, non-smokers with fewer comorbidities. And so even patient beliefs of whether or not this is important for them. A common stigma is that if someone's too old, right? They don't really, there's not much they can do for it we can do for them, but there's the evidence is overwhelming that, yeah, there's actually still something we can do for people, even if they're older. Um, and absolutely, if they're you know, just a different you know, ethnicity or, or, or sex or gender, right? There's a value for cardiac rehab for anyone with a cardiac condition, irrespective of their, of their, of their background. And then again, non-participants were more likely to be younger, female, black, and have lesser degrees of education. So we think health literacy factors in here as well. Uh, but as well as just, you know, you know, communicating to patients that, hey, like, this is important for you. You need, to, you need to participate in these things. And making, you know, everyone aware that, you know, anyone who comes into a hospital for an acute event, or has a surgery, or has stable cardiovascular disease, like, you know, is probably eligible for cardiac rehab and should participate in it. So being an advocate for your patients is, is a big, big deal. And then uh, look at other ways to address it, right? So again, we talked about getting referral of the hot school discharge plan. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania, which is in Philadelphia, an Ivy League institution, uh, looked at automatically referring every patient um, at the time of hospital discharge. So you had to opt out versus opt in. So it doesn't matter like who you are, that you got automatically referred if you came in for an acute event. So that that we found may have had have influenced participation rate, even just. Raising the awareness, just talking to patients about it, their spouses, hey, like this is important, you need to do this, huge. Uh, group classes, building a social element, this was huge in the VA, like getting patients um, to like, you know, they have to commiserate with their colleagues, their friends, their, their brothers in arms, huge. And then um, uh, patient selection of settings, we're finding that patients get to pick whether they do their facility at, on site or through a telehealth program, we'll get into that as well, um, leads to higher participation rates. And that's kind of going back to that, getting patients involved and active participate in their care. So we think that matters too. So if patients are given an option about which, which they would prefer, um, even if they choose an on-site, um, tend to have higher participation because they, they've made that active choice um, in managing their health. It's not they're just being told what to do all the time. They're getting the, you know, that would be a passive recipient of healthcare, they're an active participant. And then uh, home-based rehab. So, you know, this is a growing field, especially with what's happened, you know, in the outset of the, the pandemic of, um, but it's been around for a while, going back to the, the Scalvini group in Italy, the Birmingham group in, in England, uh, that have looked at utilizing home-based cardiac rehab through telehealth. So the patients would get a, a bike, a monitor, these are for lower um, risk patients a little bit you know, more stable, higher functional levels, that would be able to exercise at home by being monitored here by a, by a technician, could be a PT, could be a nurse, um, you know, exercise physiologist here, 
And we're finding that this can be implemented safely, effectively, with comparable outcomes to a traditional hospital-based outpatient cardiac rehab facility. And a lot of the evidence, honestly, for telehealth really kind of came in general, it has come from this, from this line of research looking at, at telehealth for, for cardiac rehab. And, and we're finding that you know, this may you know, just be as effective, obviously a cost benefit because you don't have to pay for the same overhead um, as you would for a traditional program. So there, there's, and you can have the opportunity to provide care to people who may not be able to access. So you can reach another you know, um, group of patients um, that you know, may, not, may have been inaccessible previously. Now, the Million Hearts Initiative is a conceptual framework for increasing uh, cardiac rehab participation. Um, it's an, an initiative that's been you know, across kind of the country uh, that, you know, the goal was to get cardiac rehab participation nationwide to about 70%. And the, the ideas, you know, we have listed here, addressing referral issues, addressing the enrollment issues, and then the adherence issues. And having flexible hours, we think, may be a big one. Minimize co-pays. Um, some of those financial barriers, some of those access barriers for patients, um, and then at least giving patients a, the choice um, for what they want to do. Now, other areas that may need improvement, right? There are some areas that just don't have facilities, um, you know, that there is no outpatient cardiac rehab facility anywhere. So what could be the role? So PTs could be used to supervise for lower risk patients, because often you're seeing those patients in your clinics anyway. Like you have to know how to work with a patient with heart failure because they're often working with them, right? There's obviously um, utility in promoting a healthy lifestyle and that conversations that we can have with patients to preventing them from ever having to have that first event. Active community, like getting people more active, getting people immersed in their communities with you know, uh, exercise. Use of wearable sensors and, and telehealth, I think is you know, gonna evolve and get better as technology gets better. But the thing I want to stress that people get, you know, um, wonder like, you know, what's, what's PT's role in cardiac rehab? Because like we don't see a lot of PTs doing this. Well, like PT is still PT, right? Patients have have body structure and impairments that limit their functional, you know, activities or have, they have activity limitations. We still have a role here, right? Obviously, like you don't want to practice outside of your competence zone, which is mean you're not your comfort zone because you can feel very comfortable about a lot of things, but you might not be competent. At those things and competence comes with providing care that's safe and effective and again to really work in this setting you probably need some advanced skills like you need acls you know and if you really want to do traditional cardiac rehab but for a low risk patient that has risk factors um you know you, you there i think there's a role here for pts obviously got to be monitoring and be aware of some of the things that indicate an adverse sign but i think we have a, a role here in expanding coverage and again just thinking about again health app conditions, activities, uh, activity limitations, participation restrictions. Like it's, it's an example from, from the pulmonary rehab side, but um, adapting the you know, ICF model, but you know, this is what we do, right? And we can work with those patients as well. Um, you know, and I think it, it, it involves some of the, you know, the same uh, approaches to rehab that we have for other populations, right? Like our, our, our assessments shouldn't be that much different for a patient with you know, cardiac conditions, um, right? We don't, you know, we don't prescribe things based off the diagnoses. We prescribe them off the limitations and patients with cardiac conditions often have functional limitations. So I think, again, we have a role here. And we, we described in the uh, previous lectures that, you know, the assessments that we utilize for these patients aren't much different. We would do, I would do the same exact things in a cardiac rehab facility as I would in an outpatient facility. The tests might look different, but the same hypothesis testing um, is there. And I'm just choosing the most appropriate test according to what I hypothesize to be the body structure or, um, or system that's impaired that's corresponding to their functional limitations. So we'll end there with that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think more of this will, look, will, will you know, become, become more apparent when we start going over this in our lab exercises and start getting into the tests that we would often utilize for these patient populations. So uh, with that, uh, take care, guys. And uh, this actually ends our cardiac unit. So uh, next, we'll be switching over to the pulmonary unit. And uh, yeah, we'll end here. Thank you.